Hello, my name is Dr. Sharon Lee, and I'm an assistant professor with the College of Optometry at NSU. The topic of this presentation is titled The Impact of Chronic Health Conditions on Our Eye Health. I have no financial disclosure or conflicts of interest with material in this presentation. Hopefully by the conclusion of this presentation, you'll be able to recognize the four most common causes of vision loss in the elderly and be familiar with their symptoms, the key risk factors, and the current treatment options that are available. Second, to be able to identify some common um, systemic medications that are prescribed to the elderly population that can have an effect on the vision and the eye health. And third, to be able to differentiate between terms such as total blindness, legal blindness, low vision, and visual impairment. And finally, discuss how the loss of vision can impact our elderly patients, their overall health, and the quality of life. I'd like to share with you a quote from one of my favorite role models, Maya Angelou. If you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, then change your attitude. Here are the four big components of our presentation today. And we'll go ahead and begin with the most common causes of vision loss. According to census, by year 2050, they estimate an approximately 80 million Americans will be over the age of 65. Age-related macular degeneration, cataracts, diabetic retinopathy, and glaucoma are the four most common eye diseases for this age group. These conditions are also known as the four leading causes of blindness in the world. As shown in this figure here, the National Eye Institute estimates the projected numbers to be almost doubling or tripling by the year 2050. Age-related macular degeneration, or AMD for short, is a condition that affects an area of the retina known as the macula, which is responsible for our central vision. It is with this macula that we're able to read, recognize faces, drive, or watch TV. There are two types of macular degeneration, dry and wet. Dry AMD is the most common type, affecting about 90% of the AMD patients. It is due to an accumulation of deposits called drusen in the retina. Patients with dry AMD notice a gradual loss of vision that progresses over time. And depending on the severity of the retinal changes, dry AMD is divided into mild, intermediate, or advanced dry stages. The remaining 10% of AMD is due to the wet type. This is caused by an abnormal leaky blood vessels in the retina that leak blood or fluids into the back of the eye, causing a more significant and a sudden vision loss. AMD is typically a bilateral condition, although it may progress further in one eye than the other. If you have wet AMD in one eye, the risk of developing wet AMD in the other eye is approximately 10% a year. In the early stages of dry AMD, the patients might not notice any changes to their vision. Some patients may begin to notice some waviness or distortion to their vision when reading. This can last for many years. It's not until the advanced stages where the patients will notice significant blur, distortion, or abnormal blind spots in the center part of their vision. One important note about AMD is that it does not cause total blindness, as the peripheral vision is not affected with this condition. But the loss of central vision can make it difficult to perform many of our daily activities. The exact cause of AMD is unknown, although there are a number of known risk factors. These include age, family history, smoking, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, and obesity. 
Out of all the risk factors identified, aging and smoking are the two biggest risk factors found consistently in research studies. Either smoking cigarettes or being regularly exposed to smoke doubles your risk of developing AMD. But studies have shown that people who quit smoking will have a 6% reduced risk after one year. And after five years, that risk drops by another 5%. Unfortunately, there is no cure for AMD. However, there are some treatments that may delay its progression or even potentially improve the vision. For dry AMD, an annual dilated eye exam is necessary for early detection of condition and for monitoring. Self-monitoring of the vision at home with the use of an AMSR grid is also important. Second, a large research study known as AREDS and AREDS-2 found that a certain combination of nutritional supplements helped those with early to intermediate dry AMD lower their risk of developing advanced AMD by 25%. These vitamins and minerals include vitamin C, 500 milligrams, vitamin E, 400 international units, zinc, 80 milligrams, copper, 2 milligrams, lutein 10 milligrams and zeaxanthin 2 milligrams along with the nutritional supplements eating a healthy well-balanced diet with lots of dark leafy greens like spinach and kale and colorful fruits and vegetables that contain high doses of vitamin c lutein and zeaxanthin are recommended as with many other chronic conditions lifestyle changes such as regular exercise and no smoking will be good, not just for the body, but also for the eyes. It is important to note um, that you should speak to your primary care doctor before you start taking any vitamin supplements or making drastic diet or lifestyle changes. For wet AMD, the goal is to shrink or stop the abnormal blood vessel growth and to minimize that vision loss. The first line of treatment is with an injection of a medication called anti-VEGF drugs directly into the affected eye. This needs to be done at a regular interval with close monitoring by your eye doctor. And finally, low vision devices such as magnifiers and telescopes, special glasses and assistive technology can help maximize the vision potential for those that suffered any degree of vision loss. Cataracts. There are many types of cataracts, but the age-related cataracts typically present in patients in their 60s. Think of the lens of the eye like the lens of a camera. We need this lens to be clear in order to focus the light coming into the eye and to produce a sharp picture on the retina, the film of the camera. As cataract develops, the lens becomes clouded, causing scattering of light and preventing a sharp image from forming. And as a result, your vision becomes blurred. Cataracts typically progresses slowly over months to years in both eyes. And initially, the patients may not be aware of it. As the cataracts become more dense, the patients will then become symptomatic and they can report of things like blurry vision, cloudy vision, changes to their glasses prescription on a regular basis, needing more light to read, um, trouble driving at night due to glare or halos around the headlights, and noticing certain colors becoming dull. Some may even experience double vision in one eye. If this is left untreated, then cataracts can cause blindness. Everyone will develop cataracts. As long as the eyes naturally age, so will the lens in the eye and the opacities will form to interfere with the vision. That's when it's referred to as cataracts. Other than age, there are a number of known risk factors associated with the development of the cataracts or an earlier form of cataracts. First is sunlight exposure, particularly to the UVB radiation. Smoking, 
high blood sugar or fluctuating blood sugar in diabetes, high blood pressure or obesity, and finally, certain medications can increase your risk. We'll talk more about the medications in a later slide, but a few medications to note here are corticosteroids, as these can increase the development of a type of cataracts known as posterior subcapsular cataracts, and medication Flomax can increase the risk of complications during the cataract surgery. The most definitive way of treating cataracts is by cataract surgery. In fact, cataract surgery is the most common surgical procedure covered by Medicare today. You remove the cataract lens and replace it with a man-made lens implant. But just having some lens opacity is not an indication for surgery. Surgery should really only be considered when the cataract is significant enough to reduce the vision and interfere with the person's daily activities. Until the time is right, cataracts can be just monitored with regular eye exams. Vision can be helped with an update to the glasses prescription um, and by using more light uh, when reading. Today, with the advancement in the technology and the skills, the cataract surgery is performed as an outpatient procedure with minimal incision to the eye and over 90% of patients experiencing visual improvement and quality of life. Because there is a treatment to remove the cataracts, vision loss is reversible with this condition. However, cataract surgery might not be an option for everyone. It may be contraindicated for an individual depending on the status of their physical condition or their coexisting eye conditions or it may be a decision by the patient electing not to have surgery. In these cases, again, low vision can be an option to help with their vision and daily functioning. Glaucoma. Glaucoma is a group of eye conditions that damage the optic nerve. There are several different types of glaucoma, but the most common form is known as primary open and go glaucoma or POAG. POAG is a chronic, slow progressive disorder. It's typically bilateral, but it may affect one eye before the other. This is one of those conditions that is known as a silent disease because glaucoma has no warning signs. The effect is so gradual that you may not notice a change to your vision until the condition is in its advanced stages. This picture here shows how glaucoma can affect your vision. Again, in the early stages, the peripheral vision may not be significantly affected enough to be noticed by the patient. As the condition worsens, the patient will notice a narrowing of their peripheral vision to a tunnel-like effect. They may be bumping into things or having trouble difficulty locating items, especially if they're out of the line of sight. Eventually, their central vision will also diminish. This is one of those conditions that can lead to complete blindness if it is left untreated. Here are the most common risk factors associated with glaucoma. Increasing age, particularly over the age of 60. Race, particularly African Americans. Having a positive family history of glaucoma. Having diabetes, heart disease, or high blood pressure. Certain eye conditions, like being nearsighted, having high internal eye pressure, taking corticosteroid medications for a long time, having thinner central corneal tissue can all be risk factors. Because the vision loss is irreversible here, vision can be affected before any signs or symptoms are noticed. So we need to be aware of these risk factors and detect the conditions early on through regular eye exams. Again, unfortunately, there is no cure for the condition, but there are certain treatment options that are available that can slow down the progression and potentially prevent further vision loss with early detection and proper treatment. The first line of treatment is with eye drops to try to lower the eye pressure. There are a number of eye pressure lowering drops that are available. 
the eye doctor will review your medical history and exam findings to determine the most appropriate drug for you. It is necessary to take these drops every day and preferably at the same time every day to maintain pressure at a desired level. You may take one, two, or even three different classes of this um, intraocular eye pressure lowering drug, drugs. If the eye drops don't bring the eye pressure down to the desired level, then laser and or surgical procedures will be needed. This is something we'll need to treat for years. So it is necessary to have regular follow-up visits and testing to monitor the progression. People with diabetes can have an eye disease called diabetic retinopathy. This is when high blood sugar levels cause damage to the blood vessels in the retina. These blood vessels can leak out blood or fluid. They can stop blood from passing through or sometimes abnormal new blood vessels can grow on the retina. There are two main stages of diabetic eye disease, non-proliferative and proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy or NPDR is abnormal blood, uh, uh, blood vessel or retinal circulation with some bleeding and edema. Patients may be asymptomatic or they may have some blurred or distorted vision. There are few stages of this NPDR, mild, moderate, and severe. It's the proliferative diabetic retinopathy stage that's more advanced where you have abnormal blood vessel growth. There are fragile blood vessels that grow and these can bleed, can form scar tissue and cause retinal attachment and a much more significant vision loss. It can affect both your central and your side vision at the same time. And again, it can lead to total blindness. Studies have shown two factors, the duration of the diabetes and HbA1c level that affect the severity of the diabetic retinopathy. First, the longer a person suffers from diabetes, the greater the risk of developing retinopathy. Nearly 90% of people who have had type 1 diabetes for over 10 years develop some extent of diabetic retinopathy. For type 2, those who don't take insulin, the number is about 67% and about 79% those that do take insulin. Second, the higher blood sugar level, the greater the risk. And then the remaining risk factors, we see a pattern here. A high blood pressure, high cholesterol, smoking, all being risk factors for this condition and for some of the other conditions that we've already seen. Because you can't have diabetic retinopathy without diabetes, taking medications as you're instructed, making diet and lifestyle changes, to maintain good blood sugar and blood pressure control are essential. At the time of diabetes diagnosis, patients should have a comprehensive eye exam for baseline. Depending on the severity, eyes can be monitored closely or for the advanced cases of proliferative diabetic retinopathy, anti-VEGF injections like the ones we've used for AMD, laser treatment or surgery may be necessary, especially if there is retinal attachment. Because diabetes is a lifelong condition and it can affect many parts of the body, it is important to seek proper care from multiple specialists and to minimize any further complications. If you notice vision changes to your eyes, call the doctor right away. If there are any treatments that can be given, receiving it as soon as possible will be the best way to prevent vision loss. And finally, low vision rehabilitation is available when surgical and medical treatment can no longer improve the vision. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the medications that are commonly prescribed for our elderly patients for various chronic conditions. And these medications that can cause potential side effects to the eyes and the vision. 
This list is certainly not a comprehensive list, but it can cover many of the common ones. First, amiodarone is an antiarrhythmic medication for heart conditions. This medication almost always leads to deposits in the bottom of the cornea in a whirl-like pattern. These deposits don't affect the vision, but there is a risk of bilateral optic nerve inflammation, which can cause decreased vision. And this can occur at any time while the patient is on the medication. So regular eye exams are recommended when this patient is placed on this medication. Antihistamines are usually for allergies. These most often cause dry eyes, which is already a chronic problem among the elderly and particularly our female patients. So using the antihistamines can exacerbate the existing dry eye issues. Corticosteroids are used for many conditions like asthma and arthritis, lupus, sarcoidosis, and other conditions. Many conditions require long-term treatment. Even at relatively low doses, long-term treatment of steroids can, um, can have side effects. So what are those side effects for our eyes? Well, as we previously discussed, cataracts can form with the use of chronic use of steroids. Second, you can have what's called a steroid response, which results in an increased eye pressure that needs to be lowered with the eye pressure lowering drops like, that, like what you use for glaucoma. Additionally, you can have edema or swelling to the macula known as central serous retinopathy. These need to be treated appropriately to minimize permanent vision loss. Coumadin is an anticoagulant, a blood thinner. This does not have any significant effect on vision, but it can cause subconjunctival hemorrhages or bleeding in the front part of the eyes, and these should be stopped before any eye surgery. Flomax is a medication used for prostate issues in men and bladder problems in women. Flomax has been associated with a condition that can occur during cataract surgery known as intraoperative floppy iris syndrome. During cataract surgery, the pupil will often spontaneously undilate, making surgery more difficult to perform or lengthen the operation time and increase the risk of any surgical complications. Unfortunately, stopping the medication has not been effective at preventing this. However, if the surgeon is aware of the history of the Flomax use, then steps can be taken to minimize that risk and thus prevent complications. So be sure to provide a comprehensive list of the medications um, to your eye doctor. Plaquenil is often used for rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, and you can develop Plaquenil retinal toxicity due to large cumulative lifetime doses over many years. So for those who are older than 60, those who are taking daily doses that's more than 400 milligrams or a total cumulative dose that's more than 1,000 grams or they've used it for five, more than five years, um, have kidney or liver diseases, they're all at a higher risk. You will need a baseline eye exam before starting this medication and continue to monitor the vision on a yearly basis. Tamoxifen is for the management of breast cancer. This can cause retinal and corneal deposits and edema, again, swelling in the macula, causing decreased vision. Viagra for erectile dysfunction can cause blurred vision, bluish discoloration to the vision, or a condition known as optic, optic neuropathy. Now let's talk a little bit about how vision loss can affect the person involved. We rely heavily on our vision to perform everyday activities, like we discussed, reading, driving, or work, or social activities. Routine activities like making coffee in the morning, brushing our teeth, shaving, grocery shopping, just everything becomes difficult to do. Vision loss is not just about the eyes, but it affects the individual their physical and their mental health, their independence, and their quality of life. And this not only affects the individual, but also their family members as well. 
Because of that, blindness or being visually impaired is one of the top causes of disabilities among adults and one of the most feared disabilities. There are more than 3.4 million Americans 40 years and older who are either blind or visually impaired. First of see pitch black and this is what our patients fear when they hear the term blindness. Only a small percentage of people have total blindness. Legal blindness is a term that was defined by the Social Security Administration to determine who can be eligible for certain benefits and services. It is based off of their level of central vision or peripheral vision. If their central vision is affected, then their vision has to be 2200 or worse. And that if it's 20 degrees or less in the better seeing eye, then you would qualify as legally blind. You do not have to meet both of these criteria to be legally blind. If you are legally blind, then the services and the benefits that you can receive include tax breaks, social security disability insurance, or supplemental security income, handicapped parking permits, audiobooks from the library, and transportation assistance are some of those services. Low vision is a term for when the vision cannot be corrected with standard correction, like the glasses and contact lenses. It used to be defined by a numerical criteria, like seeing 20, 70 or worse on the Snell and Visual Acuity chart. But the problem with this definition was that it did not take into account the functional problems people have with vision even better than 2070. So for example, if they had poor contrast, if they had visual field issues or had night vision problems and just couldn't perform their daily activities like they wanted to, it did not account for, the, for them. So we came up with a new term, which is more functional in definition, where even after standard correction, their loss of vision interferes with the person's ability to perform their daily activities when they were visually impaired. So the term visual impairment includes those who have low vision, who are legally blind, or are totally blind. Now, we know that as we age, we can have an increase in the number of chronic conditions. This figure looks at the most common chronic health conditions for individuals 65 and up and divided them based on whether they've also had vision impairment or not. As you would expect, these conditions are more common among older adults with vision impairment than without. Some of them as little as 11% with conditions like high cholesterol, but as much as 140%, 47% with kidney problems. The combination of the visual impairment and chronic disease among the older population has serious consequences on their overall health care. Because vision impairment can complicate the management of their other conditions, like if they can't see where their medication bottles are, or not knowing what time of the day it is to take the medications, not knowing which ones to take, having difficulty preparing healthy meals in the kitchen, they're not able to read standard size print on educational pamphlets or follow written instructions by their doctor. Their existing conditions can worsen. On top of the vision issues, if they have hearing loss as well, that makes it even tougher to communicate. As a result, older people with chronic health conditions and visual impairment are generally in poor health, 
and these patients report a poor quality of life. Vision loss is also linked to mobility issues since we use our eyes to navigate our space around us. So if our central vision or our peripheral vision, depth perception or contrast are reduced, then mobility can be greatly affected. And this can lead to falls and injuries like hip fractures. According to the CDC, the survey showed um, of the seniors reporting mobility issues, 40% also had severe vision impairment versus 11% without severe vision impairment. And this was data for the state of Florida. And it was also reported that 35% of those 65 and up reported having had a fall in the previous year. Of course, there are other factors to consider when it comes to falls and mobility issues, including weakness, poor balance, or being on multiple medications. So it's not just about the eyes, but it is critical to use a multidisciplinary approach to screen for and to provide specific interventions to reduce falls among the elderly and visually impaired population. Vision impairment is also one of the risk factors for depression. Studies have found up to a third of people with vision impairment report clinically significant depressive symptoms. And depression can occur regardless of the level of the vision impairment. And if they're not able to drive to various places, they will feel more isolated and lonely into social withdrawal. So it is important for family members and communities to provide emotional support to help our patients accept and adjust to vision loss. One condition to note here is a, a condition known as the Charles Bonnet syndrome. This is a visual hallucination that occurs in patients who have an acquired vision loss from conditions like macular degeneration, glaucoma, or diabetic retinopathy. Here, they see images that aren't real. Those images may be simple patterns like grids or light or something more complex like colorful and detailed um, objects and faces. But these images are solely visual and they don't involve hearing or any other sensory systems. The main cause of CBS is thought to be vision loss and how the brain reacts to it, similar to a phantom limb syndrome when somebody loses their limb. Patients with this syndrome are usually aware that the visions or the images that they are seeing are not real, but it can be upsetting when it happens for the first time and they don't know why. They might be afraid to tell anyone about it and this can contribute to their anxiety and depression. Because we are working with elderly patients who can have visual hallucinations from other conditions like Alzheimer's or dementia or medication side effects or drug-drug interactions, it is important to rule out some of these other conditions first. Research shows up to 40% of those with acquired vision loss can experience Charles Bonnet syndrome. There is no cure for this phenomenon and it can diminish on its own eventually. But there are some things that patients can do to minimize the episodes when they do occur. For example, by being active, being mobile, changing the environment, flickering the lights, walking towards it. And just being aware of the syndrome can help put their mind at ease. And eventually the patients will notice it less and less. What are the overall recommendations for our patients? First, we recommend all our older adults to have a comprehensive eye exam annually. Even if they feel like they see fine, as we've discussed, some of the conditions have no symptoms in the early stages. So it is important to be proactive and take preventative measures. Take care of your body with healthy diet, exercise, limit caffeine and alcohol intake, and quit smoking if you're a smoker. We saw smoking on the list as one of the major risk factors for all of the conditions. Discussed, smoking harms nearly every organ in the body, including your eyes. 
But the good thing is that smoking is the biggest controllable risk factor. So quitting smoking at any age, even later in life, can improve your chances of avoiding these potentially blinding conditions. And finally, follow the recommendations of your doctor, whether it's to come in for regular follow-up visits or taking your medications as instructed so that you can keep a healthy body with good blood pressure, sugar, cholesterol levels, and healthy eyes begin with a healthy body. So let's minimize those risk factors that can be, that can be changed. And finally, remember, even though there might not be any surgical or medical treatments that might be available, the option of low vision rehabilitation is always available to maximize the person's vision with the use of vision assistive aids like magnifiers, telescopes, electronic systems, assistive technology, and rehabilitation training through the work with our rehabilitation professionals to maintain our patients' independence and their quality of life. Thank you for your time, and please feel free to contact me if you have any questions.